Uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, briefly uh, Reverend uh, Tatsuo Muneto, uh, was born on March 8, 1941, and raised in Hiroshima, uh, Japan. And he was a graduate of Ryukoku University and received his Bachelor of Arts in Buddhist Studies in 1964. He came to Hawaii in August 1965 and was assigned to be Assistant Director of Hawaii Kyodan Department of Sunday School. Uh, he received Hawaii Kyodan Scholarship in 1967 and enrolled at Claremont Graduate University in California and finished a master's program in religion and Asian studies. Uh, ever since he came back to Hawaii uh, in 1970, he was assigned to many temples in Honolulu uh, on the Big Island and on the island of Kauai. Um, and while on Kauai, he took uh, clinical pastoral education and received one unit uh, in chaplaincy training uh, in 1987. And he retired from uh, the position of Rimban of the Hompohonganji Hawaii Betsuin uh, in December of 2015. Um, and while he served at local temples, he uh, went to India twice uh, and to the Silk Road in China uh, for pilgrimage tours. And he also published a book which is entitled Dharma Treasures, Spiritual Insights from Hawaii's Shin Buddhist Pioneers in 1995, uh, which chronicles um, the, um, the Ise uh, pioneers um, here uh, in Kona uh, on the Big Island. And um, he currently is a, a grandpa uh, and a um, hospice volunteer uh, with Navian Hawaii, uh, which is a hospice agency uh, since, 19, uh, since 2015. So without further ado, Minato um, uh, Sensei Onohashimasu. Good morning, friends. Aloha. Thank you, the Hawaii District uh, Ministers for organizing this uh, 2022 online Buddhist seminar. I feel somehow close to members of uh, temple on the island of Hawaii, because uh, I lived in Hawaii district uh, for 14 years as minister of uh, Hirobetsu and Kona Honganji. Today, when I visit the Hawaii district Honganji temples for various occasions, some of the temple members say, oh, sensei, you look uh, the same. You haven't changed at all. They are right, uh, I don't look uh, aged for the past uh, several years. Thanks to my genes, good diet, simple exercise of walking, and the Jodo Shin face, I still look young. However, I'm definitely becoming an old man, Kupuna. This year, I am 81 years old. This morning, I will talk about Shin Buddhism and end-of-life care and wish to discuss with you how our Hongaji can enhance end-of-life care for the aging members and their families. Nowadays, thanks to the advancements of medicine and uh, medical technology, we are living longer than our forefathers. Ever since Tai Chi and the yoga were introduced to people in America some 30 years ago, more senior citizens are living in good health and they look, they look very happy and living long life. That's very good. As a result of this trend, uh, some of you are taking care of uh, your aging parents or your loved ones at hospitals care homes or at your home. Whether we like it or not, eventually we all will have to receive end of life care. The Hompa Honganji's uh, recent uh, statistics, the average age of our Honganji members is rapidly growing old. Nothing is wrong with that. But it is a reality that the majority of the temple members are elderly. The temple ministers and they leaders need to focus 
this face this dire reality so that temple as a religious organization of the 21st century can provide some kind of compassionate care program. Project Dana has successfully supported the elderly and the frail in our community for the past 30 years. Many of the participants of the program, after advancing in their physical impairment, may have to receive end of care, end of life care. As Honganji leaders, how can we provide support to those people with Jodo Shinshu perspective? Here is my uh, left hand, and uh, the five fingers are all connected to the palm. Five fingers represent the children. This is Asian thought, and the palm signify the parent. Just as fingers are all connected by the palm, we are all connected by Amira's love and compassion. Nobody is left alone. Now, what does end of life care mean? The National Institute of Aging reports that end of life care is a support for people who are in the last stage of their life. Those who are approaching end of life receive this care at home, in a care home, or be cared for in a hospital from doctors, nurses, and the families. End of life care begins when the patients who are advanced in terminal diseases are likely to die within the next 12 months. People who are approaching their end of life have four kinds of uh, needs. First need is, uh, is to receive physical comfort. The, parents, the patients usually have needs to be free from pain, fatigue, difficulty in breathing, skin irritation, and so forth. To meet these needs is a primary task of the medical staff. Second need is to receive mental and emotional needs. Those who are approaching end of life have a sense of fear towards death and dying. They may feel that they are isolated from others and society. The third need is to have spiritual comfort. Spiritual needs are as important as physical needs. The patients ask if they have lived their life meaningfully. They ask whether they are going, where they are going after death. They will be able to find solace in their faith. People in religious communities can provide spiritual care through consultations, talk stories, and reading from the scriptures. The fourth need is to receive support for practical tasks. A person who is dying might be worried about who will be taking care of things after they are gone. Their families or friends can make these things clear for the person in his end of life. Among those four areas in end of life care, spiritual care is the area that Honganji as a religious organization can develop. The minister can visit the patient at nursing home for consultation. But in order to relate Amida's love to such patient who is about to end his life, the minister needs good information about his patient from the family. Early this year, 
one of the sons of the late uh, Mr. S. A. of Hirobetsim, asked Reverend Kamuro to visit his father. And Reverend Kamuro visited, visited Mr. S. A. at the Hiro Life Care Center. The sensei reminded Mr. S. A. of the presence of Amida's love and compassion. And he gave a sakura flower from Kamuera. This is a good example of Buddhist end of life care. Amida's boundless compassion provide, provided by the ministers enables the patients to respond to Amida's compassion in Gashō and Nembutsu and to live through the rest of this life. In order to enhance this type of spiritual care, the temple members' effort to contact the ministers is critically essential. I wish to relate to you a case study of a Joro Shinshu end of life care in which the power of compassion of Amida Buddha allowed the mother and her daughter to find a sense of relief. They achieved a sense of joy and peace when they heard about Amida Buddha's compassion from a minister who visited them at the care home. That was in 2014. Mrs. T was a 94 year old Nisei woman who had received hospice care at the care home in Aia for half a year. Her daughter, who lived in Kapahuru, visited her mother twice a day to care for the mother. One day, the hospice nurse and care home staff saw the health condition of Mrs. T rapidly declining with high fever and constipation. She was always sleeping without eating or saying anything. Mrs. T was a Buddhist and she regarded the Hongpa Honganji temple as her temple, but she was not a member. Her daughter contacted the office of Honganji Temple asking for the last rites, bedside service for the mother. When the minister arrived at the care home, the minister first met with the daughter, Mrs. M, to know the background of the mother's health condition. Seeing the patient lying down on the bed quietly, the minister could tell that the patient had been receiving good end-of-life care. Then he reflected on the following three things. First, the hard work of the patient. Second, law of impermanence. And third, there is no death in Buddhism. End of life is a transition. Then the minister talked to the patient. First, the minister thanked the, the patient for her devotion to her family and her dedication to the community. Secondly, the minister reminded the patient that in Joroshin Buddhism, death is a transition from this life to the next. Life is a journey from this world to the Buddha land of peace. Then the minister talked to, talked to the lady about the metaphor of a river and the ocean. Metaphor of a river and the ocean. He said, Mrs. T, Shinran Shonin told, that one, one's mind and heart were like waters flowing from the mountain, and they entered the ocean. The ocean water signifies 
Amida's infinite life that is pure and profound. Mrs. D, your mind and heart are now going into the ocean of Amida Buddha's life right now. The daughter who was listening to the minister's words began to cry with a sense of relief and happiness. Mrs. T, who knew that the daughter was crying with a sense of happiness, became also happy. Then the minister chanted the sutra, just saying it quietly as an expression of gratitude to the Buddha. Next morning, the daughter contacted the minister at the temple and related to him a change in the mother's condition the night before. Mrs. T slept very well that night. Her fever went down. She ended her constipation and sat on the bed the following morning to say good morning to the care home staff with a smile. The daughter who visited the mother at the care home was very surprised to see the mother's condition was much, much better. In a few days, the daughter took the mother home and continued to provide end-of-life care for the mother with three caregivers as aides. The three ministers of Hawaii Beijing continued to see Mrs. T at home. She passed away in 2019 at the age of 99 years old. What enabled Mrs. T to survive instead of dying at the care home? It is a combination of several factors. They are Mrs. T's own physical strength, the effects of medications, warm support of the daughter and the care home staff, and Mr. Mrs. T's feeling of genuine comfort. Thus, and this sense of grief and comfort was derived from Amida Buddha's compassionate heart that the minister wanted to convey at the care home. This power of the Dharma of embracing the person of blind desires. A bombu is illustrated in the following Wasam poem written by Shindan Shoji. It reads, river of blind passions on entering the ocean, the great compassionate bow of unhindered light filling the 10 quarters become one in taste with that of wisdom. May I repeat? Rivers of blind passions on entering the ocean, the great compassionate thou of unhindered light filling the ten quarters become one in taste with that of wisdom. This Wasan poem teaches that one's mind and heart, no, no matter how defiled, upon embraced by the Amida Buddha's love and compassion, becomes one in taste with mind of Amida. As a result of this spiritual energy touching the mind and heart and body, Mrs. T regained her health and lived for another four years at home. In Judeo-Christian tradition, human beings and God are in duality. But Jolo Shinshu teaches oneness of Buddha's mind and heart and those of Shenshin beings. An ordinary person in hearing the name that call, which is Amida's intent, save or liberate the person of blind passions, attains the true and trusting or entrusting heart, which is Shinjin. In Shinjin awareness, 
this person is united with Amira's heart here and now, and attains, attains birth in the pure land. Thus, in hearing and saying, Namo Amida Utsu, this person appreciates deeply to be never alone. The end of life here in Jodo Shinshu is the extension of this act of hearing and saying Namo Amida Utsu in the present moment, as well as at the end of life. Surrounded by the families and friends of the Dharma, a Shin Buddhist is not left alone in the end of life care. The Shin Buddhist minister's primary responsibility in his or her temple program is to realize that all things go through change and therefore life is unsatisfactory. And nobody is left alone because Amida's true compassion is directed, is directed to those who suffer. Thus, taking care of the temple members and their families with onenbutsu in the end of life care becomes meaningful and gratifying. I think the minister can collaborate with the members of Project Dana and BWA in order to reach more members of the Sangha and to enhance the end of life care programs. How can you as temple members assist the ministers in achieving this goal of end of life care? The following ideas are suggested. Attend the Sunday service and become minister's friend. Discuss about the power of Amida's compassionate vow with the ministers and with the temple members regularly. When your loved one's condition becomes critical, contact the minister. In contacting the minister before the bedside service for your loved ones, please don't wait till the moment of his or her death. Bedside service in Shin Buddhism is called, called Rinju Gongyo, the last rite that is to be held before death. Known today as uh, appreciation service in the Harai Honpa Honganji Kyodan, Rinju Gongyo is an opportunity for the dying patient to express or her. Gratitude to Amida through sutra chanting. Because this cannot be practically done by the patient, the minister chants the sutra. It is better for the ministers to say a few words about the meaning of life and to explain the purpose of in Jukongyo before the sutra chanting. The past July, a family contacted me for appreciation service for their 92-year-old father at home in Kaneohe. Before the sutra chanting, I spoke to the patient about the presence of Amida's love and compassion. He replied, the patient quietly thanked Amida Buddha in Gashio and thank the family members who gathered around him. The families were all grateful for this Nembutsu event. And this was a grateful experience for me too. In today's busy life, uh, more Buddhists are not observing the memorial services after the funeral. One of the most important services to follow is the 49th day service. Shijukunichi no Omai. This tradition is based upon a Tibetan Buddhist notion. In this tradition, 
the mind and heart of the deceased completes the period of period of I'm sorry, period of uh, suspension on the 49th day. So in Tibet, the uh, priests go to the family every week to chant sutra so that the uh, mind and body, no, uh, mind of the deceased person finishes the period of suspension on the 49th day. In Shin tradition, this service becomes a precious opportunity for the family to appreciate Shin Buddha's teachings and to remember the deceased one who has left this existence to attain birth in Buddha land of peace. I have a following conclusion today. Modern medication has controlled physical pain of the patients. Amida's love and compassion can be compared as a spiritual medicine that provides true peace and comfort. End of life care in Joro Shinshu is to provide such spiritual benefit with the importance of providing or receiving end of life care in mind. May we share Joro Shinshu teaching with our families, relatives, and friends, and with coming generations. Thank you for listening to my message this morning, and may you have a happy holiday season with your family members. Namo Amitabhis. Thank you very much, Amundato Sensei, for your presentation. Um, we will actually have questions uh, at the end of our the other presentations. Uh, so um, if you have questions, um, you can put them into the chat or um, at the time you can, um, you know, we can uh, just sig signal and we'll call on you to ask your question. Uh, so either way, uh, but uh, moving on to our next presentations, um, we will have a presentation by uh, Reverend uh, Masanadi Yamagishi and uh, Reverend um, Kazunori Takahashi. Um, Good morning, everyone. So today we have a keynote lecture from Reverend Tatsuo Muneto. And <clears throat> in his lecture, he mentioned that the people who are approaching their end of life need four kinds of need. And the third need is to have spiritual comfort. Then the spiritual needs may be as important as physical needs to those who are approaching their end of life. So in my presentation, I wanna focus on this part of Sensei's lecture and spiritual peace brought by the teaching of Nembutsu. Now there is a booklet titled Faith was Shinko published in five volumes by some Hawaii Kyoda ministers from 1957 to 1958. Hawaii District Ministers Association has been focusing on the articles in this booklet and for this seminar, we plan to refer to some articles of this booklet for our presentations. Therefore, the next presenter, Reverend Yamagishi and I will refer to an article titled, The Meaning of Preparedness, The Way to Transcend Birth and Death, written by Reverend Yoshio Hino, who served <coughs> as a Hawaii Kyoda minister from 1918 to 1958. And I'd like to talk about spiritual peace. Some of you might think that this is a very old article, but the issue of birth and death is something that we must face no matter when we live. And when we think about this, we will be also reminded that Amida Buddha's working is beyond time and space. From this perspective, I think it's significant to refer to this article. Then I translated the first half of Reverend Hino's article into English, then the Reverend Yamagishi did the second half. The full text has been distributed, so please read it if you have not yet read it. 
in this article, Reverend Hino introduced the episode between Shinran Shonin and Ben Nem and explained how Shinran Shonin was prepared for the matter of birth and death. Ben Nem was a mountain ascetic and as a Nembu teaching spread, he became jealous and hostile towards Shinran Shonin. However, through his encounter with Shinran Shonin, he became a Nembu's follower. Then now I would like to read the text written by Reverend Hino. <clears throat> ben Nen is angry and stands in front of Shinran Shonin. At that time, Shinran Shonin had no surprise, resentment, or animosity, and he welcomed Ben Nen gently as if he were meeting his long separated parents and siblings. We can see the preparedness of Shinran Shoni. His gentle attitude toward Benne, who flames with envy and anger, and his admirable preparedness to not fear death at all made Benne, who was like an Asra or fighting demon, and threw away his long sword and take off his parsimon clad robe. What could have given him such a noble preparedness? It is, of course, the path of Nembutsu. We feel joy in living and peace in dying because we have the parent to whom we encountered our hearts. End quote. <clears throat> Thus, the Reverend Hino introduced the episode of Shinran Shonin and described that Shinran Shonin was not disturbed even when he faced a life crisis because he his settled mind based on the Nembut teaching. <clears throat> and now I would like to talk a little bit more about why the Nembut teachings bring us peace of mind, even in extraordinary situations. So today we are holding a seminar on the subject of Never Alone, Shin Buddhism and End of Life Care. You might think that the episode of Shinran Shonin and Ben Nen is extraordinary, but the end of life is also extraordinary for all of us. Some of you may be experiencing a different, difficult time at this very moment, perhaps because a family member is not well. Others might have recently experienced separation from a family member. In addition, the end of life is not just something that happens to those around us. All of us have to go through it, and we never know when it will happen. Some people end their lives in their lifespans, while others end, while others end their lives unexpectedly. In the past few years, many people, even at a young age, have died. Uh, around the world due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many people have died due to disasters, accidents, or diseases. If we think only of these things, we may become pessimistic about life and have a great fear of death. However, in Jodo Shinshu teaching, However, the Jodo Shishu teaching can provide a certain peace of mind for us living such a human life. We always put our hands together in front of Amida Buddha. Amida Buddha is always here for us who live such a life calling, you are never alone. Amida Buddha is always calling to us, I know. You have worries, sufferings, and hardships. I will embrace you just as you are. I will make you attain birth in the pure land. I will make you become a Buddha. I am always with you. Please count on me. Please call my name. In Dōshinshu, Shinshu, it is essential to accept Amida Buddha's calling as true and without a doubt and to say his name, Namo Amida Butsu, in response to his calling. When we receive this teaching, we will be able to have a perspective that affirms all life, regardless of what kind of life or death 
and regardless of the length of our lives, it will be a firm spiritual foundation for us. <clears throat> In addition, when a family, relative, or friend is facing the end of life, or when we are with a person's family, we can share with them about Amida Buddha's warm compassion. Even if they have a different view of life and death, or even they believe in a different religion, we can be with them and sympathize them, considering that they are also within Amida Buddha's compassionate working. So the Reverend Muneto said in his presentation, the end of life care is Jodo Shin. The end of life care in Jodo Shinshu is the extension of this act of hearing and saying the name in the present moment, as well as the at the end of life. And the Reverend Hino said in his article, it is an unobstructed path that we walk together with Amida Buddha. It is also a peaceful journey in which birth and death are entrusted to Amida Buddha. So today, I shout about the spiritual peace brought by the teaching of Nembutsu. So let us continue to listen to the Nembutsu teaching and live each day to the fullest. Thank you very much for listening. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Amida. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Takahashi Sensei, for your presentation. So now I would like to share my presentation. First of all, I would like to thank Reverend Muneto for your wonderful presentation today. I am impressed by your talk. Especially, I was so impressed by your work our feeling of genuine comfort, this sense of relief and comfort derived from Amida Buddha's compassionate heart that the minister wanted to convey. convey. Reverend Muneto tells, tells us that Shina Shonin's words expresses that one's mind and heart, no matter how defied, upon being embraced by the mind of Amida's compassion becomes one in taste with the mind of Amida. This means that we receive the mind of Amida Buddha without doubt, and Amida Buddha's compassionate heart works on us, and then we recite Nemputsu Namo Amidabutsu with our voices. Therefore, reciting the Nemputsu is proof of Amida Buddha's mind working. This is Shinjin, Amida Buddha's compassionate heart in Jodo Shinshu. So, Reverend Hino mentioned in his essay that. Receiving the mind of Amida Buddha with no doubt, it's called preparedness. The mind of preparedness in Shin Buddhism must be pure and innocent, and also strong and firm like a diamond stone. Because this is not our continuing efforts or final result, but this is just the other power of Amida Buddha that is given to us. So we simply receive Amida Buddha's, we simply receive Amida Buddha's preparedness. What is Amida Buddha's preparedness? Shina Shoni reveals in hymns of the parent the following. Seeing the sentient beings of the Nembutsu, 
throughout the world, countless earth particles in the ten quarters. The Buddha grasps and never abandons them, and therefore is named Amida. So Amida Buddha's preparedness means to embrace all sentient beings, never abandon anyone, and lead them to the to be enlightenment and awakening in the parent. We are born in the parent led by Amida Buddha's preparedness and compassionate heart. Shakamuni Buddha says, make the Dharma your place of refuge. Follow, follow the Dharma diligently. Shakamuni Buddha originally intended Buddhism not only for deceased, but for people living in this world. We are able to learn how to face suffering or resolve our troubles in our life through the teaching of the Buddha and the Dharma. So as Reverend Meto introduced in his presentation, in his presentation, bedside service is called Makuragyo or Rinju Gongyo, the last rite should be held before death. This is last opportunity for the dining patient, dining patient to express our gratitude to Amida Buddha together through the sutra chanting. When we officiate bedside service, we always quote two wasan poems from Shinran Shonin's hymns of Pyaran Masters on the Sutra chanting, the following. Had we not received the power of the universal bar, then could we part from this Saha world? Reflecting deeply on the Buddha's benevolence, let us think on Amida always. And Casting of long compass of painful existence in this world of Saha. We live in expectation of the parent, the uncreated. This is the power of our teacher Shakamuni. Let us respond always in gratitude for his compassion and benevolence. So these Wasan poems share with us what our preparedness to Amida Buddha's benevolence and Buddha's compassionate heart is. Reverend Hino introduced one wonderful Nembutsu follower who named Chiyo in his essay. When I, when I read Lady Chiyo's life story in his life, in his essay, I shed many tears. I was impressed by Lady Chiyo's preparedness to Amida Buddha. Reverend Hino introduced her words the following, as I entrust Amida Buddha deeply and emotionally, Amida Buddha never let me go. Even if I tried, to, I tried to leave Amida Buddha and keep away. Amida Buddha is beside me all the time. I set my deep preparedness and accept the truth, but I broke the forbidden of, of my visitation to Honganji. Please follow the law and give me my penalty. So for Lady Chiyo, it was only that Amida Buddha embraces and never abandoned her, so that she accepted the death penalty with no fear of the power and the words of the authorities. So never alone means that we are all embraced by the compassionate heart of Amida Buddha. We don't need to have any fear to death. 
and worry about the afterlife. We walk on the path of enlightenment and awakening led by Abhidha Buddha. So thank you for listening to my, my presentation. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Amida Buddha. Namo Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Takahashi and Reverend uh, Yamagishi. Uh, next, we will have uh, Reverend uh, Joshin Komuro uh, and uh, Reverend Satoshi Kaimipono Tomioka uh, offer their presentation presentations. Thank you, Higa Sensei. Hello, I am Joshin Kamuro from Hirobetsu. Reverend Tomioka and I would like to present an essay by Reverend Kakusho Izumi, who served at the Hawaii Kyodan for 38 years. But before I introducing this essay, I'd like to talk about my visitation with Mr. Sadao Aoki at the Life Care Center of Hiro, since Reverend Muneto mentioned it in his keynote lecture. On February 26, 2022, I received an email from Mr. Clyde Aoki, the eldest son of Sadao Aoki. The day after his father's funeral service, the email read, Joshin, on behalf of the Aoki family, we would like to thank you and Hirobetsuin for a very nice service. Also, many thanks for visiting dad at life care and guiding him on his final journey. Please feel free to share his story with the Sangha members and also in your Sunday service. Thanks again, the Aokis. With his family permission, I would like to share my visit with Mr. Sadao Aoki at Life Care Center with all of you. On January 18th, Sadao's second son, Mr. Kevin Aoki, asked me to visit his father at Life Care Center. I rushed to go to see him. I brought beautiful sakura, cherry blossoms from Waimea. He was so happy to see them. Then I explained that I came to him at Kevin's request. He was so overwhelmed with emotion. He said, charge, charge, many times through tears. He talked about how he worked hard with Hirobetsu in Rimbans, Reverend Saigusa and Reverend Okano when he was a Kyodan president. I told him that I wouldn't forget what he had done for us at Hirobetsu and express my deepest appreciation for his service. I gave Mr. Aoki an onenju and showed him this image of Amida Buddha to his room. Kevin Aoki told me that his father said, I am going to see the Buddha. Seven days after my initial visit, I was asked to do a bedside appreciation service with his family. At that time, he was no longer able to speak. Three days later, on January 28, Mr. Sadao Aoki passed away. To end this story, I'd like to read a part of his message for the Hirobetsuin 100th anniversary commemorative service in 1990, when he was a president. Please look at the yellow highlighted text on the screen. Referring to our parents and grandparents who built and left us this magnificent temple and facilities. Mr. Aoki said, 
they truly believe that the Nembutsu is a way to salvation. Now, Reverend Tomioka will share the first part of Reverend Izumi's essay. Okay, good morning, everyone. So now, myself and then Reverend Kamolo would like to share the article written by Reverend Kepsio Izumi, who served at Kilauea, Papa Aloha, and Honokina Hongani Mission. The title of his article is the Live in the Nembutsu. So you can find the PDF file of his article, Live in the Nembutsu, on your chat box. Translation by uh, Reverend Komura and myself. So you can find it in a chat box. So this is about the a person who was named Mr. K, who got lost in a spiritual journey, but found comfort in the Nembutsu. So Mr. K was this kind of person in life history he had. His parents passed away when he was young, and he felt lonely all the time. The quest those questions came to his mind occasionally. What will happen to me when I die? Will I go to the same pure land where my parents were born? He was raised by his grandmother, who was the Jodo Shinshu Buddhist. So he had, he conducted the service at the Obutsudan or but altar every morning and evening. Also, they had a custom or ritual, like they couldn't have a meal if Mr. K or his brother didn't read the Gobunshu or letters of Renyo Shonin. So in this way, Mr. K, since he was young, he had a Obutsudan centered life, or Buddha altar centered life. Also, he exposure to Jodo Shinshu teaching. Although he didn't understand or appreciate at this time when he was young. Then, time passed, he left his hometown and began to live in a big city. In a big city, what happened to him was, as a young person, he was attracted to the alcohol, women, and the dark side of society. Eventually, he ended up becoming seriously ill and bedridden. However, thanks to the modern medical science, he recovered, and after recovering from his illness, he found himself visiting a temple, although he didn't have a clear aim to hear the norm. Maybe his lonely mind of despair was drawn to the temple to find comfort as he got lost in his life. This visitation led him to rediscover the spirit of reverence and the Nembutsu, which he had forgotten for years in the midst of busy city life. Perhaps this occurred because of his past experiences with Buddhism before he had matured. As we learned when he was young, he was exposed to the Obutsudan, altar-centered life. But now, at this occasion, it began to be matured. Then after the temple, minister is talking about one story. The story is about the parable of the two rivers of greed and anger. And this is a picture. So as you can see, like a red and blue, and then people are in the picture. So this red river is symbolizing anger. The blue color river is red. And then between the red and the blue rivers, you can see the person there. You see, can see like a kind of the white something. That is a 
the white path of Nembutsu. And you see it on the surface of the blue river here, that is Shakamuni Buddha encouraged us to take that path. But from the other shore, you can see Amida Buddha calls to us, take this white path. So Mr. K was listening to the story about a person who was suffering from an angry heart. River of fire and a greedy heart, river of water, could walk on the white path of the Nembutsu that led us to the pure land. So Mr. K was listening to this message or story by the minister. However, what he found, what he thinks to himself was in this way. Hearing this, Mr. K thought, it is impossible for me to be born in the pure land, as my heart is full of blind passion. So when he reflected on it, this story, the heart of the name Butsu was working in his life only one or two times a day, and it didn't last even five minutes. On the contrary, in reality, what he's spending well, what he had in his life was attracted to alcohol, women, making money, speaking ill of others, indulging in food, being attached to lust, and getting upset. That was his reality. Therefore, he wanted to give up, but he could not escape from the fact that he was facing the truth of impermanence. The question he had always, what will happen to me when I die? Therefore, he had to find answer, find comfort. However, he got lost and felt loneliness. Thank you, Tomioka Sensei. I translated the second part of Reverend Izumi's essay, so I would like to share it with you. Please look at the yellow highlighted text with underlining on the screen. I will read the underlined sentences in the section The Heart of Shakamuni and Amida. We can learn about the voices of Shakamuni and Amida that Mr. K was able to clearly hear. When Mr. K came to Deathrock in the way of faith for seeking spiritual truth and knew himself that got into disparate situations, he was able to hear the voices of Shakamuni and Amida, which didn't resonate in his heart before, powerfully reaching the very bottom of his heart. Shakamuni Buddha encouraged him, live and go straight on the path of the Nembutsu. That path is a straight path of sincerity, which leads you to the joy of living. The seeker was also able to clearly hear the voice of Shakamuni exhortation and encouragement and Amida's call to us with his compassionate heart. Amida Buddha said, you are my only child. I am your parent who, who fulfilled the nembutsu of the primal vow to liberate you from the suffering of karmic evil and recurring birth and death. You have an explosive temper and you get angry sometimes. Even at times, when you are burning your mind, I hold you tight and protect you with the light of compassion. Casting off the mind of self-power and doubt, entrust yourself to me and leave your difficulties to me. Buddha's heart of compassion pervades your heart and mind, day and night. I made you say, 
ナモアミダブツ、with your mouth and bring you to be born in the pure land. In this way, Mr. K's heart was able to be guided by this consoling parental affection. I will continue to read the next section, Joy of Living. Here, we can recognize his spiritual transformation. Mr. K's heart danced with joy because he could listen to the true Dharma after encountering a true teacher. He was able to leave his suffering behind, and the name of gratitude arose in him endlessly. He experienced the amazing mental transformation. Mr. K discovered that Namo Ami Dabutsu was his true parent. That discovery wiped away his feeling of many years of isolation. Whenever the, name, whenever the name arose in him, it gave him a real sense in his heart of meaning, meeting with his true parent without dying and being born in the pure land. He was given awareness and hope to live properly, brightly, and strongly through the despair of his life. Now, let me share the last section Diamond like Shinji. A Christian priest and a member of Seicho no Ie kindly invited him to their religious activities, but he never felt inclined to follow their persuasion because he was satisfied with the single path of the Nembutsu, and his whole body was filled with the joy of living. He had inherited diamond like Shinji. This is all about Reverend Izumi's essay. I was deeply impressed by Mr. K's spiritual transformation. I think this occurred because of his past experiences at the Obutsudan with his grandmother as a child. Through the life story of Mr. K, I was also able to clearly hear the voices of Shakamuni and Amida, who are my spiritual parents. I have truly appreciated the white pair of the Nembutsu that wipes away my feeling of loneliness. Whenever I say, Namo Amida Butsu, I am not alone. I'd like to close my part of presentation with Shinran Shonin's Wasan, which was presented at the end of Reverend Izumi's essay. Shakamuni and Amida, our father and our mother, full of love and compassion for us, guiding us through various skillful means, they bring us to awaken the supreme Shinji. Let us listen to the Buddha's voices by reciting the Nembutsu and living an Obutsudan centered life. Namo Amida Butsu. Thank you very much for listening. Now, to conclude our presentation, Reverend Tomioka will give us his thoughts on Reverend Izumi's essay. So, Reverend Izumi's words of wisdom reminded me of a conversation I had with a minister in Los Angeles 15 years ago. The picture is uh, myself, like a uh, shaved hair. So I asked a question to this uh, senior minister. I asked, Reverend, what is the most important thing to you as a minister? The senior minister replied, it is to share the compassion of Amida Buddha with those who feel lonely, he continued. No matter how young or old, loneliness makes people feel sad, worried, and isolated. It is my responsibility to share the joy of being embraced by Amida Buddha's compassion so people, people can find comfort. Indeed, loneliness 
is pervading in our heart and our mind. And it's so difficult to remove it, especially if it, if it is deeply rooted in our inside of us. But at the same time, Reverend Izumi wrote in this way. Reverend Izumi wrote, but the heart of compassion pervades your heart and your mind day and night. That is, amid the Buddha's compassionate calling and then commanding voice, come to my embrace, take refuge in me, Amida. Upon hearing it, I myself, Satoshi Tomiyok, I say, Namo Amida Buddha, feeling the warm embrace that calls out to me, I'm here for you, and I know I'm not alone. Thank you so much for listening to myself and then Reverend Kamuro's presentation. As a conclusion, again, let us recite the name of Amida Buddha together. Namo Amida Buddha, Namo Amida Buddha, Namo Amida Thank you very much, Reverends, um, for your wonderful presentations. Um, so at this time, uh, we can take questions um, for uh, any of our um, our panelists, uh, uh, present presenters today. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand or um, unmute and ask your question or um, type it into the chat. Oh, uh, Rose. First, um, I, just to um, express appreciation, I, I feel like the essays from um, Reverend Izumi and also um, um, uh, Reverend Kino, they're essays that were maybe 70 years ago and they're so appropriate today. I think it's just, it's yeah. really, really important thing to, to take note of. And also that our present ministers are still, you know, so um, voicing these, these opinions and sharing it with us is really important. And I, I really appreciate um, um, Reverend um, Mineto for, for his words in the very beginning and also for the, our our big island ministers for presenting this. It's 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 just it's, it's such a timely and appropriate um, um, message to be giving now and, and to be talking about. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I wonder if it's possible to ask a question. Yes, go ahead. I'm uh, wondering what sorts of um, practices do we do at the end of life? Um, let's say a person is getting close to death, then do we invite um, senseis to come or do we do certain practices with our family and friends or what kind of practices can we do to make the transition a good one? Thank you for your question. Um, does somebody, would someone like to respond? Can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, it is not that you must uh, have a, a last rites or appreciation service when someone is going to die. It is not the uh, duty of the family to do so. Uh, however, however, meeting, I think uh, it's very significant for the patient to see the families gathering together. Basically, that's most important. And the patient is aware of the interconnection with the family members, and uh, he may have a must have a feeling of thank the members. The members have feeling of deep feeling of thank, thank the, the, going, the person who is going to pass away. Okay? So basically, it's important that we get together. I'm from Japan, so may I comment on one thing in Japan today? Many people Please. are going to die in loneliness at the nursing home because 
children and grandparents are just too busy. Their grandchildren are busy, so busy. So they, they hardly visit the grandfather. So mm -hmm. uh, this is a one, one thing that's happening in Japan, which is supposed to be a Buddhist country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in Theravada countries, I think that they have uh, they have their own practice, which are considered as a duty. Yeah, duty. But in Joroshin, basically, we get together first. Then uh, we discuss things. And uh, contacting the minister is, is the very important choice. Yeah. Did I answer your question? OK, so I'm hearing two main points that it's important for the dying person and the family to express a gratitude towards each other. And then the other, uh, the very last thing you said was about contacting um, the, the, the sensei. So the sensei will participate um, in the end of life, will come there and help? That's correct, that's correct. And what sorts of things, um, I guess there was a last rite ceremony mentioned earlier and I wrote the names of them down. So the, the sensei will come and, and uh, do those, uh, perform those. Can you, can you repeat your question? Yes, uh, I earlier, um, it was mentioned um, by Yamagishi sensei, um, the last rite um, of uh, Makura Gayo and also Renzu Gongyo. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, would be performed by the sensei if we request the sensei who will come and perform these ceremonies for us at, at the end of life. In Japanese Buddhism, Binju Gongyo is the right for the deceased, the person who is going to pass away. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he is expected to chant the sutra in appreciation, in gratitude to Amida. But practically, he cannot, he or she cannot. So the minister chant the sutra on his behalf, on her behalf. Okay, so the sutra will probably be in Japanese, I imagine, right? Yeah, today we have a sutra to be chanted in English. Oh, you have it in English too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Gashio to Amir, for example. If there are mm -hmm. children around the, the patient, the minister can chant the sutra, Gashio to Amida. Namo Amida Butsu, I recite the Nida's name, deep with deep, in deep joy and gratitude, I Gashio to Amida, and so on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I guess the last question. Time. Is there any, anything else um, that, that that should go uh, with the end of life? Um, any other thing that the sense they will do or any other thing that's important to do at the end of life? Uh, say, can I make a comment? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Takashi Sensei. Ah, thank yes, you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Muneto Sensei, for your answer. And uh, actually, when I'm asked, you know, what what you know we should do at the end end of life situation of the family members or relatives i as reverend Muneto mentioned that you know i tell the you know person that you know please uh, call the temple uh, every time and uh, there are many there may be different you know kind of situation for the of the you know end of life then a minister can always you know hear you know about the situations and uh, you know we will do you know but like you know we will do respond to the situation like you know we can visit uh, that person or you know we can do bedside service also in the case of hero uh, we have a funeral information which includes uh, the procedures uh, for the funeral service also the meaning of you know different rituals you know including you know bedside service then uh, i uh, recommend that you know everyone uh, knows you know those you know rituals you know or services you know in advance and you know when and uh, the time comes you know we can and uh, ministers uh, can you know support uh, the families i just wanted to share that you know with you thank you
Thank you. Thank you, Takashi Sensei. Thank you, Minato Sensei. And, and thank you, Matt, for your, your question. You know, the um uh the services uh, at end of life, uh, the bedside services, the Rinju Gongyo uh, before someone's passing or the Makuru Gyo after someone's passing, you know, are important um, opportunities uh, for family uh, to gather and to offer appreciation, uh, to reflect on life, uh, to um, help to, um, you know, uh, especially beforehand to ease the transition uh, of an individual uh, into the Pure Land and to begin that process of, of grieving um, as, a, as a family um, and loved ones together. Um, so, you know, um, oftentimes, you know, ministers are called um, after the fact uh, someone passes, mm -hmm. but it's far more important uh, to call uh, beforehand and, and the ritual mm -hmm. can help to facilitate um, that process of, of, of being together, uh, of mm -hmm. saying uh, their love, uh, to their loved one, right? And, and to be able to share in that transition and to ease that transition mm -hmm. uh, to, to the Pure Land. Uh, and so um, it, it's very important, I think, you know, to be able to have the opportunity, right? As a family uh, and uh, to be with your loved one uh, in that time and to honor, um, uh, you know, the, the, profound, the profoundness of life and death, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sensei, can I share yes. one more thing? You know, in such a situation, I always say that, you know, Amida Buddha is working, a person who is dying or a person who passed away. At the same time, Amida Buddha is working and uh, other family members who have you know, difficult time. So Amida Buddha is always working for all of us. So I want to, you know, emphasize, you know, that part. For the Shin Buddhism, Shin Buddhism end of life care. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Say something. <clears throat> oh. um, Carrie, yes. Yeah. Um, so I was my mom's caregiver for 12 years that she passed this year. And I wanted to share with you that when you have this quality time with an elder, even when they pass, even knowing that they're going on to the Pure Land, it's it warms your heart to know that you shared this time with them. And I think for the man that's wondering about the uh, whether to um, ask for someone to do the last rites, if your elder is an elder and they're, and they're of the faith, ask them what they want. Because even though you may be removed from it and, um, it's about them, and if they, if they would like to have the last rites, or they would like the minister to come before they pass so they can share the teachings, that's really important to them. And as a hospice-trained person myself, and this really puts it in perspective for me, um, um, as a hospice person, um, you're really trying to get the best care for your elders so they'll be comfortable and without pain, but also they need the spiritual part of their being also to be addressed. And if your parent or relative that you are representing, representing today, you know, um, you need to talk story with them and, you know, they, they don't want to be a bother, but you have to make it clear to them that they're not a bother and you just want them to have the passing that they want to have. And so, and, and when the Reverend said they have the information at the temple to explain to you, then if you read that and then you talk to your elders so you're on the same page, it makes it a lot meaning, more meaningful and they will be so happy that, that you are involved in the in the, um, their passing. Yes, I think the desires um, of the person who's passing are the most important thing to consider. Thank you, thank you. Um, there was a um, question in the chat uh, from Carol. Uh, can a lay person do an end of life service if a minister is not available at the time of death? Does the family wait for the minister? What's the practice on the island of Hawaii? 
Are there any, any uh, policy or? In Honolulu, we have a uh, minister's aid, day minister's assistant. Mm. So in Hawaii, Beijing, I believe uh, they can be asked to support. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, in Hawaii, Beijing, there are four ministers. I think, or oh, just, just a comment. During the Second World War on the island of Hawaii, there was a Limba Aoki who was not interned. But in Honolulu, there was Reverend Hirasa, who was a lay minister. So she used to take care of the, this kind of uh, what you call uh, uh, the cases, uh, family uh, going to lose a loved one. So they contacted Reverend Hirasa and she went to, to provide support. But today, I think it's proper to contact the temple and the temple should uh, make arrangement. Uh, they need us, definitely, I believe they need us can do that. Mm -hmm. They need us can do that. Did I, did I answer your question? Minister, do you have any comments? I think, well, it's nice to have a minister um, present, uh, if, if possible. I think if circumstances are such, you know, that the families can gather together, you know, and offer their appreciation, um, you know, because of the embrace of Amida Buddha is universal, um, that I believe that, you know, families, you know, you can uh, just uh, be together with your loved one and offer appreciation um, in that way. Um, if a minister isn't available. Um, yeah. That's good. It was a situation uh, where the family was not available and uh, the person was uh, taken to the mortuary and the family didn't see the person until uh, pre-cremation rites. Mm. And that was very difficult, I understand. Mm -hmm. So what happens in a case like that? The families didn't have a time to meet the... No, didn't oh. have time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. The family members, I think, uh, again, should remember the basic Buddhist teaching no impermanence, life constantly changes, and the life doesn't move according to the wishes. This is the basic tenets of uh, early Buddhism. So family members should be aware of these teachings of the Buddha. Too bad they, were, they didn't have a chance to say goodbye to the family, right? So they shouldn't feel guilty. They shouldn't feel guilty. They just missed a chance. That happens to many families. That's okay. For me, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Carol, I think also, um, you know, the, the pre-cremation service then would become the opportunity, right? And, uh, and to work with the minister to help facilitate that, um, that process of, of grieving and healing um, and honoring uh, that loved one uh, that they didn't have the opportunity to have a bedside service for, um, you know, uh, you know, the bedside service isn't um, like a requirement, but it is something that is an opportunity, a beautiful opportunity to be able to honor a loved one and to begin that process of, of healing um, and, and all the rituals, right, of end of life that we have are, are very beautiful moments, right, intentional moments uh, that focus our attention and focus our hearts and minds on life and death and our loved one uh, and offer the opportunity to, to process and to heal. Um, and so, you know, that, that's why we have ser these services. You know, I think we've seen throughout the pandemic how important these rituals are and these, and these moments um, of togetherness um, are to our lives and to our, our wellness, right? And our own healing, so.
I was also wondering if uh, there are so many um, traffic accidents, um, mass killings. Um, is there a chaplain uh, at the police department or uh, someone who can uh, serve the Buddhist community at a time like this? Uh, as far as I know, I, I do believe the um, the police department does have chaplains on staff or have volunteer chaplains. I think I'm not sure. I think Reverend Al Urasaki is online somewhere, um, and I think he may be able to speak to uh, to that. Um, but um, uh, but you know, uh, you know, as um, as members, you can reach out to any of our ministers, right? Um, for for spiritual support uh, mm -hmm. in in. in in, when you are experiencing spiritual distress. So, Reverend Diane Soga was a police chaplain on the island of Hawaii, and he still is uh, in Waikapu. And I know there is a young uh, minister from Soto Mission, Bishop Sun. Soto Mission, uh, Bishop Sun is a chap police chaplain. I believe. Uh, I believe, no, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't have any current uh, information. Can you put that on chat so we have it in writing, the names? Okay. Thank, thanks for your question, Carol, and thank you, Reverend Mendelton, for your response. Um, I think I saw Rose, you had your hand up. Just um, something that Carol said made me think, um, I, I retired critical care. I worked at Hilo Medical Center and ICU for like 25 years. And just for like in the, in the future, it's so unfortunate when the family member is not there at the time that the person passes, mm -hmm. but um, it, it may be, I'm sure it was different during, you know, when COVID, when the isolation, isolation was so strict, but um, a lot of times if, if the if the pet person that passed had to go to the morgue, um, there's like state laws involved in how long they can actually stay out of the morgue. But um, mm -hmm. if possible, the hospital will um, you know make arrangements in the chapel, the hospital chapel, um, and and, um, and and can always have like a bedside service or at least you know a final a final viewing um, for the family. Um, in the past was possible. I believe it still is. So. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Um, we can take maybe one more question before we conclude our, our time together. Or any final thoughts from any of our, our ministers? Um, uh this is not a question so my but so i i want to introduce my back background picture is a uh, why may add cherry blossoms yeah as reverend <laughs> muneto and reverend kamuro introduced the yeah, uh, yeah his story uh, yeah mr sadao aoki's yeah, story so this is a uh, uh why may add cherry blossoms so and uh, so next uh Next February, next year, so Waimea has a cherry blossom, uh, heritage cherry blossom festival. So, so, so if you're available, so please join us. Thank you. <laughs> just, just, I just wanted to introduce this picture. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yamagishi Sensei. Uh, anybody else? Uh, well, I just saw in the in the chat. Um, uh, Reverend Alan Urasaki uh, just mentioned that um, we are able to do bedside services uh, via Zoom or FaceTime or other means of, um, you know, uh, of, of technology uh, to be able to connect families and loved ones. Um, I know I've done uh, a Zoom uh, or FaceTime um, bedside service for a family. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I believe other ministers have done as, as well. So, um, so, you know, there are, uh, you know, one of the, right, one of the silver linings of the pandemic has allowed us to, 
uh, expand our use of technology to be able to, uh, to care and to serve um, families uh, in need um, you know, during these times. So. Um, so I wanna just thank everybody uh, very much for, for being here and joining us uh, uh, today uh, to have a conversation on this very, very meaningful and important topic of end of life care. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Reverend Moneto and all the Hawaii district ministers for their amazing presentations um, and their um, sharing their wisdom and their aloha uh, with everybody. Um, and so just uh, in closing, um, we do uh, have a HDMA, a Hawaii district ministers association YouTube channel. And this will be um, uh, posted on the YouTube channel for future viewing uh, and sharing. So, um, you know, please look out for that. And um, so, oh, and Reverend Tomioka has just put it into the chat. So you can check the, um, the YouTube channel out. And we have um, also videos from past um, events that we've, we've held. So please um, check those out as well uh, for the online Dharma learning. So uh, again, uh, thank you everybody for, for attending and for being part of this. Um, and so please join me uh, in Gosho and let's recite the, the Buddha's honored name in gratitude and joy and awareness. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namanda Namo Amida Again, mahalo everybody. Thank Have you. a happy holiday. Thank you all the ministers.